afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar on the EPBC Act. My name is Brad Malenko, partner here in the Clayton News Post Office, and with me, Mark Etherington, special counsel here in the Clayton Office. This webinar is really following up on a previous webinar, which we did, looking at Graham Samuel's initial uh, discussion paper around proposed changes to the EPBC Act. And at that point, this was approximately six weeks ago, or two months ago, I think, uh, we speculated as to what sorts of things we might see come out in his interim report. Well, we now have the interim report here, and we've got a much better idea of where Graham Samuel is heading in terms of the kinds of changes that he would like to see and is proposing to see in the EPBC Act. So this afternoon, Mark and I were just going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, some of the issues, some of the, uh, the positions and the approach that Professor Sam was taking in this report. And of course, if you've got any questions uh, or any comments you'd like to make, happy to receive them. Um, I believe there's a button just down to, I'm told, down the uh, right-hand side of your screen, which you can press to put questions up and, and to answer those. And of course, this uh, webinar is also being recorded. So if uh, if you want to share it with anybody, you're welcome to. And if you, there's any further questions or ideas later on, of course, we'll have to discuss it. This interim report is out for discussion now, and they're seeking commentary by the 17th of August, with an idea, with the, the goal of a final report in October. So with that introduction, I thought I might just jump into some of the key issues that we've seen in this report. And really just, Mark and I just been discussing back and forth. And as I say, at any time, if you've got a question, just, just hit that button and type it in. The, it, it seems to us that really, uh, Professor Samuel is attempting to reshape the act, um, obviously still within the constraints he faces under the constitution. So we still have the, basic framework there, which is matters of national environmental significance, and that framing up the uh, role that the Commonwealth will play in terms of environmental assessment. But what he's clearly trying to head towards is get a devolution, if you will, of that assessment power to states and territories. And in order to do that, you really have to have a framework. And that framework then is the national standards that he's talked about and planning. So from that point of view, obviously, as lawyers, one of the things we're always interested in is, is the detail. But that's because when we start looking at national standards, a whole bunch of issues arise. And the first thing that comes up is trying to understand just how Commonwealth is going to go about uh, developing these standards, particularly when it gets to the granularity, which is what uh, Professor Simon Professor Sam is going for. Mark, what do you think in terms of this, the, these national standards? What, is, what are some of the key issues that you see arising in this approach? Well, I think the national standards are, are clearly going to be quite pervasive. They're going to touch on procedural aspects uh, and there's therefore a lot more rigour in, in terms of the information that's required, uh, how the devolution to states is going to occur. But significantly, there's going to be in an ideal sense, uh, significant more guidance, information required, uh, information given about substantive heritage, uh, environmental aspects, uh, Indigenous heritage aspects, uh, some cultural heritage aspects. I thought it was was interesting that uh, the interim report, which is quite quite detailed for an interim report, I must say that a lot of work's gone into it. Uh, you know, effectively the starting position, which arose through the comments received. Uh, he says, the evidence on the state of Australia's environment put forward by the scientific community to this review is compelling. Overall, Australia's environment is in a state of decline and under increasing pressure. There are localised examples of good outcomes. However, the national outlook is one of decline and increasing threat to the quality of the environment. At best, the operation of the EPBC Act has contributed to slowing the overall rate of decline, but not fixing it. I mean, I think that's uh, it gives a really good indication where he's going. This is not a let's fix the rough edges, the bits that aren't working. He's effectively saying the Act as a whole doesn't achieve its objective and therefore a rigorous major overhaul required. 
and we'll see that through the National Environmental Standards Framework. Uh, and so I suspect that that is going to be quite a uh, comprehensive, quite a large process, talking about both interim and, and final views. There, there, a lot of work needs to be done uh, to achieve that. I suppose that raises the big question of, you know, is it going to achieve the desired outcome? Because, you know, the bar's set pretty high in terms of what he's looking to achieve out of it. Well, what I'm wondering is whether it's going to be achievable at all, quite frankly. I mean, I think national standards, you say it quick enough, it sounds good. That's one. But uh, how do you get there across various jurisdictions around the country, right? And particularly if, I mean, we've got these prototype standards, and, we, and the standards are at a very high level, things like no net loss for threatened species. Good idea, but what is no, what is net, net, what is loss mean? So once you start to try to articulate that through interim standards, how, how much detail do you start to give that? Where do you land with different jurisdictions where you might have uh, species found in different places and different conditions? The context is always important here. And then when we get to this level of granularity of final standard, I mean, the comparison he uses is with the NEPM, uh, where you've got numbers, and he talks about things like you know the number of species in or number of individuals of a species in, a, in an area per hectare, so less pretty specific. Yes. So if we can get there, that would be great. But do we think we will see that much more? I thought there was a very strange approach where he makes the comment that the development of these standards is to be made by the Commonwealth government alone and not involve the states. This, this, this sphere of negotiation is going to result in the lowest common denominator. Uh, I thought that was a bit of an odd comment, particularly in reference to the NEPM, which is obviously through uh, a scientific uh, committee involving state input. So effectively you're saying we want the NEPM, but we're not going to use the NEPM framework, which I think in some ways is a missed opportunity because it would provide the level of trust that is also identifying the report is missing from the current framework. Uh, my fear is if it's just a com Commonwealth policy formation process, to get these national standards, one would ask, why are we going to see anything different than the level of policy that we're currently getting? Um, and I think that that is a bit of a, a problem for it. I mean, I think an, another interesting aspect, and accepting the two stages, two stage process of interim and final standards. Another comment is made around the lack of long term monitoring data limits the ability to understand the pace and extent of environmental decline which actions to prioritise and whether previous interventions have been successful. If the, at least the interim standards are on a level that provides us with the database set, the, it has a higher threshold requirements for the information quality and extent that proponents must put through their, their process, then I think you can achieve that granularity. It will take time and it will take a lot of money to develop, but we, but we may get there. Uh, we well, want to do that though. So what we really need then is a common again the legislative framework for that, but then a whole series of discussions, right? Committees and different groups. My understanding is that that process is beginning already. That you know, Graham Sandman is working through that exercise, and they're going to try to come up with something, ideally some interim standards by the time we get to the legislative drafting stage, which we doubt will be until October. But you would think to go from the interim standards into the final standards could. Potentially ten years in terms of the negotiations and discussion. This then raises for me the question: Okay, evolving the power down, you you you've got prototype standards, interim standards, and presumably a degree of regional planning, strategic planning. So, but that that framework may be a bit in flux for a while, in a sense. You know, what I mean, like we might not get those those really hard standards for a while. In the meantime, we're looking at trying to move the decision making down the path. I know that WA for example is quite keen to do that and get, get some of that evolution. I mean they talk in the report about accrediting uh, alternatively either both assessment and approval or assessment or accrediting regional planning. How do you think it's going to work in terms of the assessment and approval and try to actually like you mentioned about you know trying not to end with the lowest common denominator here. We need some sort of standards, procedural standards. Okay. Yeah, look, I think I think we 
we will need procedural standards because I think the devolution, whereas the national standard is effectively, as I read it, the crux of, of the changes he's mm. representing. I don't think Professor Samuels thinks he can achieve the outcomes without the national standard. And equally, I don't think he can achieve the national standards without the devolution to the state because that would freeze up the capacity and potentially the funding yeah, yeah, to, that's, to that's achieve those standards. Yeah, uh, and then go into your question about how that works in the interim, because I think that's right, because now we're devolving decision making to the state uh, and the state actually taking on all of that into including potentially the compliance aspect of those decisions, which which makes sense because it's very difficult to enforce an approval. That's not your own given that. Um, but how that devolution happens in the interim when the granular standards aren't there, I suppose is, is the problem. That that presumably that problem is if what, what leads to the discussion about the accreditation process, which I can see working in the interim phase, but I do have a somewhat of a difficult of that notion in the long term because I think a lot of resources unnecessarily will get consumed through accreditation rather than cross vesting legislation that just directly devolves, particularly if we've got these granular environmental standards. There's no reason why we need to be accredited because quite frankly, the legal question becomes, does your decision accord with the standards, which will have a legislative basis? So look, I think there's some questions around that and I'm also somewhat concerned and I know that we'll get to talking about the review mechanisms that are proposed a little bit later. Uh, Professor Samuel does have a, a nice throwaway line basically criticising um, lawfare reviews currently being process driven that doesn't achieve any great environmental outcome. Uh, to me, the accreditation process provides another opportunity for process driven review. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So in other words, you get through the whole review, review process and then somebody wants to challenge the very foundation on which it's been run. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, just picking up on your point earlier about the compliance. So we know that um, enforcement and compliance Mr. Sanders recommended independent, that's not going to happen. But clearly, enforcement and compliance does have to occur. And I thought it was an interesting line in here. Once you've accredited state and territory uh, systems to assess and approve, and as you mentioned then, compliance would occur at that level, because of course that's where the approval is coming from, unless, as he puts here, there's an egregious breach, which are not being effectively enforced by the credit party, then the Commonwealth can step back in. Uh, it'd be interesting to see just how that would play out <laughs> yes. with uh, a state. Uh, and whether or not they've been egregiously breaching their uh, enforcement powers. Um, so then you mentioned just then about merit, and I think that's something certainly as lawyers we're quite uh, um, focused on is, is the whole appeal exercise and, and how that would occur. Now, as you say, Professor Samuels certainly uh, criticizes the uh, process driven appeals that have occurred to date, which were really a function of the fact that that was the mechanism available under the Act was to go to um, the ATT and, and uh, the AT and make a, a, a process type appeal because that's what you have. He's now talking about a merit appeal and he talks about a limited merit review on the papers. What's your sense of that? Uh, well, I must say my first response was that this is the gift to uh, the potential uh, community activist groups and so forth, because this is a, is a fundamental shift uh, in their favour. The discussion was preceded by a discussion of whether the current broad standing arrangement should be broadened, and he took the view of, no, that wasn't necessary, uh, but then went on to say, and I should caveat this, I, I think the rationale, if reading between the lines for the broad and merit review, is the sense of we're going to have these strong national standards at a granular level, uh, and we're going to have uh, better information, uh, better databases, uh, the phrase single source of truth, which I have a bit of difficulty with that phrase, and, uh, and whether that, 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 that then starts conflating issues, because it almost had the sense of thinking that merit reviews would be scarce because the information would be there, the standards would be there, it's a much simpler way yeah. to, in theory, yeah. in theory, but as yeah. we know from legal reviews, that's not how things play out. The Professor Samuels acknowledges that environment is a very complicated area in exercising discretion, 
And that's the heart of a merits review, is weighing the considerations. The way in which the considerations were weighed, did, does the, is that the correct and preferable decision? It can be acknowledging numerous outcomes that are possible, yeah. Yeah. is this the best? And that is a relatively easy way to open up a merits review. I think what is also then interesting is, it goes one step further and says, look, it's, uh, it's not going to be a de novo review, presumably thinking that this is going to help uh, the decision maker and the proponent by limiting the review to the information that's before them. So it'd be, uh, on the, as it says, on, on, the, papers, on the papers. Yeah. But the legal ramification of that is a higher level of information addressing both environment, social and economic yes, considerations yes, 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 yes. needs to be in the papers because yeah. you get, then get challenged on your, your weighing considerations uh, by submitters, you have to be a submitter, but that's not a, a high threshold. Uh, now, you don't a proponent doesn't have the opportunity at that point to supplement the information. So all that information has to be up front. Now, maybe Professor Samuel says that's a good outcome because the quality of decision making is better, uh, but it certainly does, I think, add a lot of complexity to approvals process by uh, pushing forward a lot of the information and also I actually do think there is a, a large amount of scope, even if on the papers that still involves a fair bit of work in analysing how the considerations were weighed, particularly these ministerial considerations of economic and social, which often proponents just leave to the minister and aren't transparently recorded, even when decisions have to be written down. And so I, I accept the point about why the public may feel a lack of trust in those. But all of that, I think, opens up quite a, a bit of a hornet's nest for, for challenges. Uh, well, I think also, particularly in WA, where in, you know, the structure that we've got under our Environment Protection Act, the Minister for Environment does not consider social and economic. Right? That's a consideration of the ministers at the very end. That's been very clearly set out and, and, and recognised by the courts. So now we're going to have a process where if accredited for both assessment and approval, one would run through the EPA process, and then uh, it ends up going to the ministers, and that's where the social and economic comes into it, presumably because those ministers can bring their very various portfolios to bear. So what I'm hearing you say is that it may be that proponents are now going to have to think about that a little bit more in advance, not just put up environmental evidence, yes. but start to put up the economic and social evidence, but of course the EPA always been limited from right. considering those sorts of things. So it does raise a question in the WA context of at what point does that information then go into the system? When is it going to be evaluated? And how is it going to be evaluated? Transparent manner so that it can then be formed part of the final decision. But I think that's right because the, the review in the state system from the EPA's report is limited to the environment. There's no point putting that information to the yeah. EPA because they can't consider it. Uh, they, wouldn't have the they wouldn't have the expertise to deal with it. Does, and then at the point where you wait for that and you potentially run through your appeal, ministerial appeals on the recommendation to then put that information in, there is at least the perception of uh, trying to gain the system by then going, oh, look, this is the environmental outcome, this is what we're balancing. But I, but I think that's the point where it has to go in just before what would otherwise in the state system be the section 45 yeah. decision making. Well, that's it. And maybe it's going to be that the state's going to have to look at that as an aspect of its decision making process in terms of it being accredited under this. And of course, at a state level, since we don't have merits review, uh, we've still got judicial review, there is the opportunity that once we get a decision, different aspects of those decisions are going off on appeal in different forums. So judicial review at the state, potentially judicial review at the Commonwealth, if it's a process-driven argument. Uh, at the same time, there could be the third Commonwealth merits uh, review from the same decision, uh, managing those could be a, a, a complex situation. So the point is that just like with national standards, I think it's it's a good elaboration. I think this this line, you know, limited merits review actually raises a whole bunch of issues that will have to be explored, presumably through either the bilateral exercise, if that's the way WA and, and the state and the feds are going down, and or through the accreditation process uh, to be able to uh, not end up through the one-stop shop approach, in fact having more appeals than we had originally. Yes, I certainly think that's a likely outcome.
Let's just move on to then uh, our single source of truth, the data. So the point there is to try to come up with a database that is uh, of, of common uh, use. And, and the model there, in fact, is the model here in WA that we developed, which is nice to see. Uh, and the, and uh, Professor Sanders talks about a national custodian to have a responsibility for you know, facilitating collaboration of this, developing, overseeing it, and that sort of thing. I think his goal and his, his hope is that with that national database, you will then have better information going into the system and presumably information then that uh, you know, the states can draw upon, the territories can draw upon, and, and the Commonwealth, if need be, can draw upon it as well. Yes, I, th I think the idea of a, a single, if, if not a single data point, a, a database, a single entry point, which could reference others, and uh, I, I do think that the environmental standards providing detail about the level of information required, the specificity and the quality of that information would provide a better uh, universal coverage. That would also mean that information from different projects could be cross-referred in a cumulative assessment perspective. Uh, I agree with, with his statement that currently that there's no single national source of truth that people can rely on. This adds to cost of business and governments as they collect and recollect the information they need. It also results in less community trust in the process as they question the quality of the information on which decisions are made and the outcomes that result from them. I actually think that this would be a good outcome for the community because it provides them with access to information and potentially in responding to appeals. Uh, a lot of these community groups don't have the funds to engage their own scientific advice and it provides them with a basis to, to pitch a submission rather than just um, a really vague motherhood statement that doesn't really assist and, and uh, not surprisingly, largely gets ignored through the decision-making process because it's really hard to weigh against the actual scientific evidence. So this aspect of the decision, I think, makes sense, provided that it's limited to the context of capturing better quality data and making it available rather than seeing that the single source of truth being having greater outcomes in determining the outcomes of, of the review as mm -hmm. such. Uh, One of the issues that arises, of course, who pays for it. And uh, I think it was interesting on page 98, it sets out how he sees all these various elements being paid. Um, and for example, the, obviously the government would be the, pay, the person paying for the development of the standards, but then he has business paying for the approvals, the monitoring, the compliance, enforcement, and assurance, and then the cost being shared on the data and, uh, and information you're smiling. <laughs> I, I am smiling. I think it, it, it makes sense as a nice high-level statement of principle. It's a little bit like the polluter pay, pay principle. Uh, to the extent that monitoring, compliance, data collection is driven by your project and your project assessment, it should be on, on you. Uh, the, the compliance gets a little bit hazy, and I, yeah, that's and I wonder if this is uh, a bit of a Trojan horse for annual licensing fees to, to uh, for the assessment of annual compliance reports, or whether it might be that there's a fee that's lodged when you lodge your annual compliance report for it to be reviewed. Strict enforcement beyond that in terms of yeah. prosecutions yeah. Should, will always be, should, should be borne by the state. I'd be surprised if that's passes on. Look, this is premised on the view that a better quality database of information should result in ongoing survey work being cheaper because proponents don't have to redo the same work that someone else did. I think there is something in that. But again, we're not talking about the same footprints for project to project. So query, you know, whether there's, uh, this is a little bit Optimistic, but I, I do think there is a there's a live question now about uh, the funding aspect, and I think the the Commonwealth Minister may have put out a press release effectively saying to the states, "We're not giving you more information, more money for this, but come and talk to us." Uh, so yes, there, there's an un, uh, there's an underlying question here that hasn't yet been resolved. Hopefully, it will be in the final report around the the financing and, and what this means, because as we know, finances killed strategic assessments like the Swan Coastal Plain before on that question being left unresolved. Just segueing from that one, the last two things I wanted to 
just touch on was regional planning and offsets because I think they're both sort of related. So coming out of the money side of it, one of the questions I was wondering about with the national standards as part of the framework, and obviously regional planning, strategic planning is another part of that framework, and that makes sense if you can get these together. Query how you pay for all that regional planning because you know when we have seen examples of it, 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 it does tend to get pretty large scale uh, and pretty involved, and therefore it costs more money. Um, so it, it strikes me that the regional planning goal, like with national standards, is a great goal, and I wonder just how that, where the link's going to be between the Commonwealth and the states and territories in that planning exercise, and who's going to take the lead, and how that's going to coordinate, and then how that relates to offsets, because presumably if you've got a planning exercise, that will help to identify some of the offsets that are out there. Uh, well, no. I, I, I do think there, there is a big question mark there. Whether the idea, the thinking is that the removal from the Commonwealth of assessment to the states would free up sufficient money for both the national standards uh, and the regional planning uh, query, because we've seen the um, yeah. recovery planning largely just generate a bit of motherhood statements for the area without any underlying data and monitoring. Uh, and therefore, ongoing planning and review and uh, adaptive management in that space. That's clearly what Professor Samuels is contemplating. Uh, and there will need to be a large amount of funding, I think, to actually shift from that mindset of what we have. Because otherwise, the regional planning does risk being a business as usual, which clearly is, is not working. So uh, there's certainly a, a funding question. I'm, I'm not sure yet this... Uh, this paper identifies that there's going to be a, a material shift uh, because of the funding question. Well, I think funding and also just in terms of who takes the lead and how that's actually been organised. I mean, it's one thing to accredit an assessment process, but what's left off the table here is well, how are these planning processes going to be run? Yes, is it's a common just going to step back and say, okay, fine, you guys do the regional planning, you know, you do the strategic planning, and we're just going to only do that national strategic planning that we need to do, um, in, in which case. Is there going to be still coordination where you know you've got jurisdictional boundaries and environmental, you know, the critters don't care, move around. So making sure there's that level of coordination still needs to happen. And also within the offset category, because we've we've seen more recent times, so with the Pilbara Fund, where the financial contribution through offsets then used being pulled and using for regional research for cumulative impacts, which is a positive positive outcome. Uh, the discussion of offsets in this paper is suggesting to go in a different way, which is to be more about uh, restoration of offsets and advanced offsets. It looks like in the thinking that, he, that Professor Samuels is thinking that the private sector may take over some of that on the ground research to provide advanced offsets. That may be, at least in the short term, somewhat optimistic. I'm not sure without Mm. Uh, the environmental standards and the, the plans actually being in place that the private sector would take up that risk that what they produce can actually create effectively biodiversity credits. Well, if you have a, if you have this, because that's what he said, you need that certainty. Yes. But then it, I mean, future, idea, though, because it could create you know an offsets market and people getting out there and, and doing stuff in advance. Yes, for future revisions, I think yeah. that certainly there's the potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Good old. Mark, was there anything else you wanted to cover? Oh, was... I think that look yeah, in terms of in terms of the big ticket items, I, I think that covers it. There's there's a lot of detail uh, in this at, at different levels. It's a 114 or so page document, and, and as we say, this is the interim report, so yeah. it's specifically not seeking to address in detail all of the issues. So there are a number of uh, other aspects to this, including indigenous engagement. Uh, and the like, but um, which will be more relevant for some people than, than others. Uh, but certainly at this stage, I think that probably covers the main issue for uh, most people in West Australia. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the, uh, if you have any additional questions, please, please feel free to follow up with us directly. And also, as we sort of highlighted, there's obviously going to be jurisdictional related issues. You know, WA is a bit different than New South Wales, Queensland and so forth. There are some other seminars being offered by our other offices. There was one last week in, uh, in Brisbane, and there's, uh, I believe there's another one coming up this week in New South Wales, which also will be recorded, so you can access those if you'd like to. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on this session. It's a bit of an experiment for us uh, in this 
new world of video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we haven't received any questions, so I think that pretty much wraps it up for us. So have a nice afternoon. Thanks.